Hi, I'm Susan, and today we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day by talking about water, in particular water quality. So of all the water that's on our planet, 97% of it is salt water, which means we cannot drink it. The 3% that, left, that is left is fresh water, but of that, 2% is either stuck so far underground we can't reach it, or it's frozen in glaciers. So we have 1% of our fresh water supply that we're able to access and able to use. Not just us, but also the plants and animals on the earth that need fresh water. So it's really important to keep that water clean. So I'm gonna talk about some of the things that are threatening our water supply, some ways we can help. And we're also gonna run through some tests so we can see how clean the water we're in right now is. So what's hurting that 1% of fresh water that we have access to? It's pollution, but not just pollution in the form of trash. It's not just littering, but that is bad for water. Um, it's something called polluted runoff. So this runoff can come from a lot of different places. It can come from farm fields. So if a farm field has uh, too much pesticide on it, when it rains and that water washes that pesticide away, it can wash into streams and pollute the water. It can also happen on construction sites. Um, if someone's building a house or a building and there's nothing to hold the soil down, that soil is gonna get hit with rain and it's gonna run off and uh, create something called sediment that's gonna run into the water and pollute the water, make it harder for the animals and plants to live in it. Um, and there's also runoff just from parking lots and driveways and things like that. So any chemicals that get on those surfaces, um, like chemicals from your car leaking or anything like that, um, those can't soak into that asphalt. So when, the, when it rains, all of that polluted runoff is gonna run off down into a stream or a creek or a lake and pollute the water. So these are all different sources of polluted runoff um, and they're a big problem for our water supply. Next, we are going to do some tests on this particular stream. Uh, so we can get an idea of how healthy it is. The tests I'm using are from a program called Save Our Streams. It's from the Isaac Walton League of America. It's actually a citizen science project. So if you watch this video and you decide you're really interested in helping uh, monitor water quality, uh, keep track of how clean our water is, you can actually go to their website. I'll show it to you at the end. And you can go to a training for Save Our Streams and figure out how to do the program that I'm gonna do today. I'm just gonna do a sample of the tests. I'm not gonna do all of them, but it will give you a good idea of how the program works. So again, if you're interested, you can then go and do a training and do it yourself. Um, so I'm out here at a place called Reynolds Creek. This is a property owned by the Porter County chapter of the Isaac Walton League. Um, and we're gonna figure out how healthy this stream is. The first set of tests we're gonna do are testing the water chemistry of this stream. So the chemicals that are in it. Um, we are just gonna do a couple of them. Again, we're not gonna do the whole program, but the first one we're gonna do is called dissolved oxygen. So it's testing the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the water. Um, and we need this to be at a good level because all the plants and animals in the water, just like the plants and animals on land, need oxygen to survive. So we want this to have a healthy level of oxygen dissolved in the water so those plants will be okay. So to do this, we're gonna rinse our little test vial. And we need to fill it up to the 25 milliliter mark. I know that's gonna be hard to see from that far away. So, let it fill up with water, a little bit more. All right, so we're at 25 milliliters. So we're gonna take this and we're gonna test the amount of dissolved oxygen in it. All right, now we have our sample. So we're going to take this ampule and this has something in it called an indicator solution that's gonna react with the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in this water. So, and this is something you would learn in the training. So you're gonna break this into the vial. Let it fill up. Convert it a few times. Mix it up. And now we're gonna wait two minutes to let the color develop in this. And then we're gonna check to see how much oxygen it has. All right, it's been two minutes. So now we're going to use this to compare it to the color in our uh, ampule, and we're gonna see how much dissolved oxygen is in here. So, see which one it matches the best. I think it's right about here, right between six and eight, so maybe about seven. So let's go look at the chart and see if this is a good amount of dissolved oxygen for this water. Another piece of information we need to figure out dissolved oxygen is the water temperature. So we're gonna take our thermometer and we're gonna put it in the water for two minutes. And after two minutes, we'll read the temperature on it. All right, so it's been two minutes. So it looks like our water temperature is about 18 degrees Celsius. 
So now we're gonna go put that number with our dissolved oxygen number we got before, and we're gonna figure out the dissolved oxygen in the water. So down here on the chart, we have the number we got from the ampule. And then up here we have our temperature, which is about 18, it's about right there. So we would see where those two intersect. Draw a line right up there. So it's gonna be about 70. So if we go down here to the chart, 70 is good. So this is actually a pretty good amount of dissolved oxygen. There's a lot of things that can affect dissolved oxygen, like time of day, water temperature, all kinds of things like that. Um, but right now we're in a pretty good range for the plants and animals that live in this creek. So always remember to keep out an eye out for other stuff too that's interesting to see. Here we have a really tiny toad hanging out by the edge of the stream. Next, we are going to do our phosphate test. So phosphorus is definitely something plants need to survive, but it's also something that can cause a big problem if we get too much of it in our water supply. So uh, measuring the phosphates in a stream are a really good way to figure out how healthy that stream is. Um, having too many phosphates, they can come from places like runoff from a farm field, um, fertilizers from your garden running off into a stream are another big source of phosphates. Uh, phosphorus is a nutrient that plants need, but again, too much of it, we get too many plants growing. Uh, we get something called an algae bloom. Algae is a plant that lives in the water. Um, so a whole bunch of algae will bloom in the water, and then as it dies, those decomposers, like bacteria, who also need oxygen, come in to eat it, and they use up all the oxygen that the other aquatic life needs. So things like fish and other animals don't have enough oxygen and they die off. So phosphate is a chemical in the water that we want to keep track of and make sure it's within a healthy level so that all the aquatic life in the stream can be really healthy. So now we're going to do our test. So we need to fill this with 25 milliliters, just like the dissolved oxygen test. All right, and now we're going to do our phosphate test. The phosphate test is similar to the dissolved oxygen test, so a couple more steps. We need to add something to the water called an activator solution. And this is gonna mix with the solution in the ampule that we're gonna use in a little bit and uh, use that color change to let us know how much phosphate is in the water. So we had two drops of this. One, two. And again, this is what you would learn in the training. So if you decide you wanna do this, you check out the training on the website. We're gonna put our cap on very carefully so we don't spill it. And we have to shake that up to mix it. Then we're gonna get our ampule. Just like we did with dissolved oxygen. Just carefully take the cap off so I don't spill it. And then just like dissolved oxygen, we're gonna break this tip off. Let that fill. Mix it. And then we're gonna wait two minutes before we compare it to the colors on the indicators. Now it's been two minutes, so we are gonna get our comparators out and figure out our level of phosphate. So you have two in your kit um, if you do this program. You have a high level one, hopefully we won't have to use, and we have a low level one. So it's the same way with dissolved oxygen. You're gonna put it between the two, figure out which color it matches. We're gonna go all the way down here. It doesn't even match this one. This one here is a little, really light blue, whereas this one's pretty much clear. So that means we're not gonna use our high level comparator. We're gonna use our low level comparator. The way this one works is you put your ampule on the top, and you hold it up to the sun, you can see underneath. You're gonna see what color it matches best. So it looks like it matches. It's pretty low. Looks like it's 0.1. So again, the ideal is 0.11 to 0.34. So that's great news. We don't have a lot of phosphorus in the water. We have enough that plants can survive, and the animals can survive but we don't have enough to cause problems like an algae bloom. So the phosphor phosphate in this water, it's a good look. So we've seen a couple of the chemical tests you can do to see how healthy a stream is. Now we're gonna do a different kind of test. We're going to look for something called aquatic macro invertebrates. So aquatic means they live in the water, macro means you can see them without a microscope, and invertebrates means they don't have a backbone, they don't have a spine. 
So looking for these animals in a stream can give you a really good idea of how healthy that stream is. Certain ones don't do so well when a stream is really polluted, so you're not going to find them when you're looking for them. Um, whereas others are very tolerant to pollution, they can handle a lot of pollution, so you might find a whole bunch of those. So we're going to look for some and see what we find, and hope that gives us some idea of how healthy this stream is. So now we are going to sample for some aquatic macroinvertebrates, and we're going to see which ones we can find. Uh, while you're doing this, it's important to try to get a few different areas of the stream because macroinvertebrates, uh, you can find them in a lot of different places. They really like living in things like this. So I think there's a lot of organic matter, like leaves built up, a lot of sticks. There's a lot of places in here they can grab onto. And this is a really good place to sample. Our bug so we're going to collect a bunch and then we'll take them up to the table and we'll see what we can find. Really carefully. Now we have our macroinvertebrate sample. Um, we're going to take these guys, put them in submission, see if we can identify them so that it can give us um, some idea of how healthy this water is. And then when we're done, we're going to safely put them back in the river so they can go on with their day. So here are some of the macroinvertebrates we got from that sample. Um, this definitely isn't all of them, but I just wanted to give you a quick picture of some of the ones we found. If you, were do if you did the training and you became a water monitor for Save Our Streams, you'd probably find a lot more bugs than this so you can get a better idea of what's living in that stream. But we're gonna start with these. So when you're identifying macroinvertebrates, there's five questions you kind of go through. Um, the first one is, does it have a shell? So if we zoom in on this guy here, we can see that this macroinvertebrate does not have a shell. So our next question, does it have legs? Yes, it definitely has legs. So then you're gonna look at how many pairs of legs it has. So it has three pairs, six legs total. Next, you're gonna look for a tail. Does it have any obvious tails? And this one definitely does. It actually, it's a little hard to see, but it actually has three tails coming off the, the back of it. And then how big is it? This one's probably about like an inch long, but size can vary a lot. This is actually, once we've gone through that identification process, is a damselfly larva. So damselflies, you've probably seen them flying around. This is what they look like in their larval stage. So when they're still babies living in the stream. So this will eventually turn into one of those small, it looks kind of like small dragonflies that you see flying around. So a damselfly larva, the other thing we want to look at is the chart of how sensitive to pollution it is. So there's three levels. There's very sensitive to pollution. There's less sensitive. So they are sensitive to pollution, but not as much as some of the other things. And there's tolerant of pollution. Damselfly larvae are in that middle category. They are less sensitive to pollution. So they're still gonna be affected by it, but not quite as much as some of the other bugs we have living in our streams. So this is a good thing to find. This indicates uh, like fair or good water quality. So now we'll do our next one. We will look at these next. Some of you might know what these are. Uh, if you go through all the steps, you'd find out that this is a crayfish. These are two crayfish that live in the stream. So again, they are from the same category as the damselfly larva. They are in that less sensitive pollution category. So right in the middle between tolerant and sensitive. Um, so these are a good thing to find. There's two of them here. There's probably a lot more living in this stream. The two macroinvertebrates, and these are really big. You can definitely see these without a microscope. And they get much bigger than this. Here is another one. This is actually a lunged snail. So this is from that tolerant category. These are pretty tolerant to pollution. So it's not a bad thing to find them in your the stream, as long as you're finding stuff from those other categories too. Um, it just means that you're pretty likely to find a lung snail because they can handle a lot of pollution. So even if your stream is getting on the unhealthy side, you can still find these macroinvertebrates. Um, pretty common. But again, you want to try to find more in the other categories as well to really figure out how healthy your stream is. If you're only finding these, your stream might have some problems. Here's another one that you've probably seen the adult version of this one flying around. This is a dragonfly larva. So when it's still in that larval stage, that baby stage, it's actually living in the water. Um, and then eventually it will turn into that bug that you guys see flying around. So these, 
same category as the damselfly larvae. These are less sensitive to pollution. So more sensitive than that lung snail, um, but not quite as sensitive as some of the other things we might find. So this is a good thing to find, dragonfly larva. This is a very common one you're gonna find. It's called a scud and has a whole bunch of legs. They kind of look like little shrimp. Um, this same category as the dragonfly and the damselfly. It's that less sensitive category. So right down the middle. Um, but again, yeah, you'll probably find a bunch of these if you end up doing the training and going becoming a water monitor. This is one you're gonna wanna learn how to identify because you're gonna see it all the time. These are pretty common. A cool thing to find though. Here is our final macroinvertebrate that we're gonna look at today. This is a black fly larva. And this is in the same category as a lunged snail. This is very tolerant of pollution. And you guys have probably seen the adult version of this too, if you've ever seen a black fly flying around. So you'll probably find a lot of these if you end up being a water monitor. So based on the macroinvertebrates we found, this stream would have a rating of fair or good, right down the middle. We found a lot of things that are slightly sensitive to pollution and a lot of things that are very tolerant of pollution. We didn't find anything from that sensitive to pollution category. That doesn't mean it's not in here. Um, when you're doing water quality monitoring, you want to come back to a site multiple times and get a lot of samples so that you get a really clear picture of what's living in that water. We wouldn't just base it off one sample that we took one time. So um, the last step of this is we have to put these guys back in the water. We can't leave them up here. So we're going to carefully put them back in the stream so they can get on with their day. So here is a damselfly, all grown up from that damselfly larva. This is actually an ebony jewel wing damselfly. So you'll probably see these if you're out doing water quality monitoring. Here is something, this is not a macroinvertebrate, but it is another bug you might see while you're in water quality testing. This is a water strider, and they like to sit just on the surface of the water and move around. Now we have a snapshot of the health of this stream. It's in pretty good shape. Um, but again, we would wanna come back a few times and do a few more samples. So we get a really clear picture of how this stream is doing. If you wanna help out our water at home and help keep it healthy, there's a really simple thing you can do. And that is don't pollute, don't litter, but also pay attention to the chemicals around your house. Don't dump cleaning supplies outside. Don't dump them down a storm drain that might be in your neighborhood. Dispose of them properly so they don't end up in the water. Um, if you have a garden, don't use too much fertilizer. Because again, things like phosphorus that we tested for, too much of it will get in the water and it will cause a big problem with the oxygen levels in the water. Um, and also paying attention to your car, making sure your car is not leaking any chemicals into your driveway that are then gonna get washed away into the water supply. Just really simple things you can do at home to make sure you're helping keep the water clean. And then the other thing you can do is you can become a stream monitor. Um, if you wanna check out the website, you can see what program you need to do, what training you need to do, what resources you need, and you can learn how to do the tests I did today and help monitor the water in your area. Um, again, you do wanna go through that training before you do a program like this. You don't wanna just come out and do it um, so that you really know what you're looking for and you know how to do it safely. Um, so those are just two easy big things you can do that are going to be a huge help to our water supply and also help keep track of how healthy it is. Here's some evidence of a mammal that needs clean water. This is um, some beaver activity. This is a beaver dam that's being built. So another animal that needs this stream to be really clean and healthy. All right, so we saw that really small toad earlier and then we have an adult frog here. This looks like it might be a green frog. I don't want to get too close because I don't want to make it jump away. Another cool thing to find. So before we go, I want to tell you about one more easy way you can help streams, and that's by participating in a project called Stream Selfies. This is again through the Isaac Walton League, and it's just you taking a photo of yourself near your favorite waterway, either at your home or on vacation or a place you visit a lot. Um, so this is a great way to help them create a map of all the waterways we have in the U.S., and it's an easy way for you to participate in something that's going to help keep our water healthy. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining me today. I hope you learned a lot and I hope you had a lot of fun.